Good morning. It's very good to see you here this, I guess it's not quite stormy, but threatening stormy Sunday. Uh, to those of you online, a uh, warm welcome to you also. Uh, today's service will be about an hour long. There'll be some prayer, some song, and hopefully if we listen attentively, we will hear God speak to us today. I got a couple announcements to make. Uh, first, uh, an update on our summer camp. It is going well. Uh, great group of LITs. Uh, in fact, they're nodding in the front that they're a great group of LITs. So that is wonderful. I am in total agreement. Um, we also got to go um, to Wedgwood Pool and we saw a former LIT and leader uh, working as a lifeguard and looking all handsome in Baywash-ish. Uh, so uh, really proud of you, Thomas. You're doing good. Um, next week is an anniversary Sunday, and the Reverend Todd Nelson will be um, leading the worship that day. Um, it'll be communion also. Um, there'll be refreshments followed by the service. So. It's one you don't want to miss. And then on August 7th, uh, Peter Kupish will be here. Uh, we're gonna live stream that service. Um, so, uh, you know, encourage you to invite a friend or we'll send out the link for the live stream uh, in the weekly email and you can share the link out if uh, you feel you, someone you know needs to hear the message that Peter will bring that day. Uh, today, we won't be passing the offering plate, uh, but there is an offering plate at the back if you came prepared to uh, bring an offering. Or you can click online on our website, the donate button, or send an email to office at St. Andrews uh, Islington and send that way. This summer has seen an uptick in visits to our food bank. Um, and as a result, our food bank is getting, uh, well, the cupboards are getting empty. So just an encouragement, um, if you can or you're able, please uh, bring non-perishable foods to the food bank. I'd also, you know, suggest that uh, water is appreciated, uh, water bottles. Uh, we do get a number of people who um, won't be able to use a can or a can opener because they're homeless. Uh, coming to our food bank. So if we only bring canned goods, then it's hard to give them anything. Um, so those sort of things, anything related to the heat, uh, if you find anything that uh, helps someone with the heat, that also would be appreciated. So again, just, you know, uh, we, we depend on your generosity for our food bank. Now I'm going to invite the praise team to come up, and as they do, just ask you to take a moment of silence to prepare for worship. Let's stand and sing together.
sing his praises whatever is his way all is well he makes us rich and poor that we might trust him ever-present God, we seek and you offer. We ask and you give. We knock and you open the door. Ever-gracious God, you hear the requests of your people and in your goodness you answer. In Christ, you offer the gifts of new life and hope to all who seek your blessing. Through your spirit, you pray within us, even when we can't find the words. Receive our praise and our prayers this day, O oh God, and draw us into your holy presence so that your love will transform us to serve you in the world that you love. Ever faithful God,
quickly we would forget the gifts we've received from your grace. Instead of giving thanks, we ask for more. We complain about what we lack and fail to trust in your generosity. We refuse others the forgiveness we seek for ourselves. Forgive us, O oh God. Transform our hearts. Reshape our desires so that we would reflect your goodness in the way that we live. We ask it in your name, Jesus. Amen. Let's stand and sing this next song together. So uh, over the past few weeks, we've been talking about the loss of transcendence, how our world has become disenchanted, that we've surrendered our ability to look past the superficial things, the hard things, the things we see, the things we touch, to see that there's more to the world than just what we pick up with our senses. In our first week, we sort of teased that idea out. We talked about an invitation that we received from the prophet to go to the ancient path to look for the way that is good and then 
to find rest for our soul. And so each week we've been sort of looking at that ancient past path so that we can find that rest for our souls, learning to rediscover our idea, our sense of the transcendent. The second week, we demonstrated how our loss of transcendence has begun to impact our faith, how it's diminished our sense of God's grace, how our loss of transcendence has diminished our sense of God's grace. We've lost the sense that there is a givenness to our world. There is a givenness to our world. Do you know what I mean when I say givenness to the world? I mean that you didn't make it, right? Um, that when you get up in the morning and you look out, wherever you look out, um, nothing there you made. Maybe you assembled some things if you've got Ikea stuff in your house, but you didn't make it. You didn't bring it into being. And even you, you didn't bring into being. Or your feelings, or your emotions, or the things that give you joy, or the people you love. You didn't bring them into being. Because there's a givenness to the world. It's gift to us. So we talked about that, and then last week we talked about um, how our disenchantment, how our loss of transcendence has even impacted how we read scripture. Uh, we treat the Bible like we're doing an autopsy, right? We study it to find out what happened, and then we try and piece it together. Um, but it is God's living word. It does speak to us, and our loss of transcendence, our disenchantment, means that we don't necessarily come to it with the expectation that it's going to speak to us today. So if we can recover that transcendence, we can change the way we interact with our holy text and begin to believe that as we approach it, that God is going to say something and that what he's going to say is urgent and important and that we can read it with expectation. So that was the last couple weeks, and now today in our final week, I want to talk about how our disenchantment impacts our sense of abundance. The spirit of our time can appear to be one of joyless urgency. As a culture, we've become less interested in the exploration of the givenness of things, and we've become instead interested or developed a deep sense of fear of scarcity. We live in fear that there's not enough. Do you remember the toilet paper issue of two years ago, right? We live in deep fear that there's not enough that there's a sense of scarcity and it be has begun to impact our faith. And perhaps it's the fault of our consumer culture, right? Uh, it's certainly beneficial to any manufacturer or marketer for all of us to feel as if there isn't enough because that drives us to go and purchase more and that helps bottom lines and uh, stimulates economies and I, that's a good thing in a consumer culture. Maybe that's to blame, at least in part. And, and, and maybe, maybe it's the echo of a voice spoken in the garden a long time ago asking, didn't God give you anything to eat? Maybe it's an echo from the past that still speaks to our hearts. And so we question, isn't there enough? And in contrast to all of that, if you read your scriptures, you find that gifting and generosity are characteristics of God. 
It's how God interacts with humanity and the life in which he calls them to. He gives, he gives, he gives. He is generous, he is patient, he is kind, he is steadfast, he provides. Totally different than our sense of scarcity. Today we're going to talk about abundance and scarcity and maybe how recovering our sense of transcendence may help us live with a greater sense of abundance. Before we do, let's pray. O generous God, we thank you for your kindness and for your patience and your hospitality, your hospitality to us. Help us to hear you in the words spoken today, in the songs sung, in the prayers. Help us to put aside for a moment our worry about what's going to happen later today or our fear about the things that we've left undone that might catch up with us. Help us instead to have ears that are attentive and hearts that are open, that we might hear your word. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Our scripture reading is found in uh, the Gospel of Luke, chapter 21, verses 1 to 4. As Jesus looked up, he saw the rich putting their gifts into the temple treasury. He also saw a poor widow put in two very small copper coins. Truly I tell you, Jesus said, this poor widow has put in more than all the others. All these people gave their gifts out of their wealth but she gave hers out of her poverty and put in all she had to live on. This is the word of the Lord. So as always, I've got three points um, and they're pithy and you can write them down and it helps you know when things are gonna end. So they're good. Uh, the first point is from commodity to gift. From commodity to gift. Second from, uh, the second point is planting gardens in the desert. Planting gardens in the desert. And the third point is when little is big. When little is big. So our first point, uh, I'm gonna tell a story. It's from uh, Lewis Hyde's uh, The Gift. It's a strange, I'll tell you up front, it's a strange uh, Scottish folk tale. It's called The Girl and the Dead Man. So you've been warned, this is a strange story. Um, it's about a mother who sends her three daughters out into the world. They've reached that age where they're supposed to leave home and go out and discover and do things. And so they're all getting ready to leave the house. And as each one is about to leave, the mother offers them a uh, choice. They get either a small loaf of bread and a blessing, or they could have, in box number B, is that the, how that, that show used to go? You can have this box or this box. In this box was a small loaf of bread and a blessing. And in this box is a large loaf of bread and a curse. And you can choose whichever you want as you go out into the world. Do you want the small loaf of bread and the blessing, or do you want the large loaf of bread and the curse? Someone should go, da, da, da. Anyway. Um, so the first girl, the youngest girl, uh, she leaves the house, or the oldest girl, she leaves the house, and uh, she's presented with the choice, and she chooses, well, I want the large loaf of bread and the curse because I don't know when I'm going to get my next meal. I better get the large loaf of bread. So she asks for the large loaf of bread, and she receives it, and she leaves the house. And as she's on her way on the path, she encounters some birds. And the birds speak to her, and they ask her, 
can we have some of your bread? And, well, she chose the large loaf of bread because she wasn't sure when her next meal was going to be. And so she can't give that away. So she says no to the birds. You can't. This is, this is my treasure. I need to keep this to keep myself going. So she protects her loaf of bread. Well, as she gets further out into the forest, it's getting nighttime, and she's hungry, and so she eats the bread. But for whatever reason, it's not satisfying. She's still hungry after she eats the large loaf of bread. And it's raining, and it's cold, and she's in the forest without even a sleeping bag. So she has an awful night's sleep, right? You can imagine being in a dark forest, wolves doing the woo-woo-woo and all that stuff. It's kind of an awful experience. She's wet. She wakes up in the morning tired, and she's really hungry now. The loaf of bread wasn't enough. And so now she needs to go out and find a job. So she heads into the nearest town that she finds, and in that town she meets... uh, Uh, a widow and the widow is caring for her brother and her brother is suffering some from some sort of strange magical spell and you have to watch him at night I don't know why doesn't say in the story perhaps he raids the cookie jar but he's suffering from some sort of magical spell and you have to watch him at night if you don't watch him bad things happen so the, the widow says, do you want that job? Would you watch my brother as he sleeps to make sure that nothing bad happens overnight? All you got to do is make sure he's safe overnight. Sit up with him. She takes the job because she needs the money. She doesn't have any more bread left. She's very hungry. She's cold. She's wet. She takes the job. So she sits down next to the brother. She hasn't slept. And she's tired. And she starts to doze off Well. She's watching the person she's charged with to care for. Well, the widow comes in and discovers her sleeping on the job. Told you it's a strange story. The widow discovers her sleeping on the job and whacks her. But unfortunately, she whacks her so hard, she's dead. So now we've got, this girl didn't make it. Um, Strange story, I know. Well, the second daughter leaves the house. And as she leaves the house, she's presented with option A, a small loaf of bread and a blessing, or option B, a large loaf of bread and a curse. And what do you think she chooses? The large loaf of bread and the curse. She does. So she goes out on her path, and she runs into some birds, and the birds say, please, can we have some? But she chose the large loaf of bread because, well, she wasn't sure when she was going to get her next item of food, and she was hungry, and so she needed to treasure this loaf of bread. She says no. Then she eats the bread, and strangely, she's not satisfied by the bread. She's still hungry. Then she tries to go to sleep, but it's raining. It's cold. She's in the forest. She doesn't even have a sleeping bag. And so she has a miserable night's sleep. She realizes when she gets up in the morning, hey, I need a job. I better get a job. She heads to the nearest town. She meets a widow there, and she's offered the job. And because she hadn't slept, because she she wasn't able to stay up overnight, and whack, two. The third, the youngest daughter, leaves the house, and she's presented with the choice. Option A, the small loaf of bread and the blessing, or B, the large loaf of bread and the curse. And she chooses the small loaf of bread and the blessing. And so she leaves the house and she heads down the path and the birds approach her. And uh, they ask, "Can can we have some of your bread? And for her, the treasure is the blessing. The bread was just a gift, and gifts are meant to be shared. So she shares her bread with the birds, and together they eat the bread, and she's full. And in return for the gift of the bread, the birds say, let us wrap you in our wings so that you may sleep safely tonight and warm and dry. 
because it was raining and they were in the forest and she didn't even have a sleeping bag. So the birds wrapped their feathers around her and she slept wonderfully, safe and dry and warm and full. She woke up in the morning and thought, well, the next thing I should probably do is get a job. So she went into town. She met a widow there. The widow said, hey, I have this brother. He's under spells. You need to watch him all night or bad things happen. Can you take this job? Stay up with my uh, brother and stay awake. She says, okay, I can do that job. But she's well rested. She's well fed. And she's had a good night's sleep and felt safe. So she stays up all night. In the morning, um, the uh, widow comes back and uh, discovers her there and that the, 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 the brother has had a good night's sleep and that the young lady, the youngest sister, uh, was awake all night and she gives her a peck of gold and a peck of silver and a magical cordial. The younger sister uses the magical cordial to bring her sisters back to life. I told you it was a strange story. The difference between the older daughters and the younger ones is important for us. It's how they place values on the mother's gift. What did they value when they were given something by the mother? For the older sisters, what was at stake was the bread, right? Something they can see and they can touch and they can carry in their sacks. That was what they valued. The bread is a commodity to be accumulated and to be protected. What guarantee for them, in their mind, were they going to get another meal? So they needed to get the bread. The younger daughter knows that there's more to the world than just bread and that there's more at stake. Gifts are something to be shared. They're not meant to be hoarded. Another way of describing the difference between the girls is that the younger daughter knew that the world is enchanted, that blessings matter. The older daughters invited the curse on themselves thinking, what harm could a curse do to me? Better get the bread. I'm not afraid of any curse. Because the world is disenchanted for them. All they care about is the commodity, the thing. To them, the bread was real and the curse was a superstition. And at the end, they found themselves hungry because the bread wasn't ever going to be enough. And maybe, as someone once said, we do not live by bread alone. The younger daughter lives in a different sort of world. Sharing the gift was more important than keeping it. Sharing the gift was more important than protecting it. And in turn, the world revealed itself to be abundant providing her with all that she needed. A commodity, a commodity is valued by the cost it takes to make it and the market's desire for it, right? A commodity is only worth what it costs me to make and how much you are willing to pay for it. A gift is an expression of relationship. If we fail to recognize giftedness in our world, then we are prone to see the world as mere commodity. And rather than experiencing abund abundancy, we are like the older daughters, experiencing scarcity. Our story, our biblical story of the widow's might underscores the principle of gift. The widow gives like the youngest daughter in our strange, creepy Scottish folktale. She can give all she has because she has confidence that there's more to the world than what she can see, than what she possesses. And please 
understand this is not a fundraising drive. I'm not uh, talking necessarily about church finances. I'm talking about a principle of, of how we live. I'm talking about our souls. Uh, how we view the world matters. It does. If the world is reduced to commodity, then you and I will live with a sense of scarcity. But if we recognize the giftedness of the world, that there's more to the world than just this, then we can live with a sense of abundance. Jesus said, the thief comes to steal and kill and destroy. I come that they may have life and have it abundantly. And those shouldn't just be fluffy words to us, nice, warm fuzzies. If we've lost our sense of transcendence, transcendence that's all they are. But if we believe that this is a God-created world given to us and that it has purpose and that it has meaning, that you have purpose and that you have meaning, that you are gift and I am gift and this is gift, the light streaming through those windows is gift, then Jesus' promise is life overflowing into eternity. The thief is not the one we should put our faith in. When we live in scarcity, when we hoard and we pile up, we are placing our faith in the thief that he might win. In a disenchanted world, things are stripped of their dis 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 of transcendence. Everything becomes commodity and we live with an immense and overwhelming sense of scarcity. scarcity. We live afraid of the thief rather than in the faith of the good shepherd. Our second point, you ever try and grow tulips? You ever try and grow tulips? It was a big thing in my neighborhood growing up. Everybody grew tulips, and everybody talked to each other about how they grew tulips. It wasn't just like you planted a flower and you forgot about it, but tulips were a thing. Um, you know, people across the street would come over, and my dad and my mom would talk to them about their tulips and what they were doing to, to grow their tulips. It was like a community thing. Everybody had the tulips. And in my neighborhood, everybody had the same method for growing tulips. You'll find, as you talk to people who grow tulips, everybody's got different answers about their, their method. In, in, in our neighborhood, the trick was you'd plant the tulip bulb in the autumn, you would enjoy them in the spring, and then you would, I had to write this down, I had to phone my dad and ask him so that I was right, um, but this is what we did. Uh, then you'd dig them up after they finished flowering, um, and you'd deadhead them, and then you'd store them in the basement or somewhere where there was no light uh, so that you could plant them again in the fall and they would flower and you'd kind of wash, rinse, repeat every season until the bulb uh, was done. And of course, there are many different ways of planting tulips. Uh, some folks just put them in the ground and let them go. Different answers, uh, different methods, uh, and it's interesting to me is that there are so many different methods to tulips. And I think part of the reason why that's the case, why we all have different methods for growing tulips, is because tulips are finicky. Tulips have a rather. They have a place where they'd rather be. They'd rather be on a rocky mountainside in Turkey, where they came from, than in our gardens. And so tulip people plant tulips different ways in order to adjust for a tulip's rather be. The tulip would rather be in Turkey, on a mountainside, where they're from. Tulips have rather be, rather be. I think a lot of us have rather be. Tulips, like many of us, struggle to bloom where they are. They'd much rather be somewhere else. 
and rather bloom there. And so we work hard to grow tulips. And I suppose there are conditions in life where we feel it might be easier to bloom there, some ideal environment. We, we all have our rather bees. In the Hebrew scriptures, we're told that when a great number of people of Israel were taken into captivity in Babylon, that the prophet Jeremiah sent the elders and the priests a letter to these people taken into captivity. So for those who don't know, uh, a foreign power came in, took the rich, the educated, the influential, the YouTubers, the Twitterers, those guys, took them all off to uh, Babylon where they would live in captivity and left everybody else without all of the skills and, and influencers, without all the special important people that made society work. They took all those people into captivity, so now these people are living under a foreign power. Not their rather be, right? They'd rather be probably back home and not being overseen by a foreign power. And the prophet Jeremiah writes a letter to them there in captivity, and he says this, this is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says to those I carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and settle down. Plant gardens and eat what they produce. Marry and have sons and daughters. Find wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage so they too may have sons and daughters. Increase in numbers there. Do not decrease. Also, seek the peace and the prosperity of the city to which you have been carried into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, you too will prosper. It seems to me that the prophet Jeremiah is telling those exiles, I know you have rather be's. I know there's some place you would rather be, but bloom where you're planted. I know you have rather bees, but bloom where you planted. Produce where you are. All too often, folks shut down. They hide, with, withhold, they retreat because they feel as if they would rather be somewhere else. And, well, until we're somewhere else, we can't behave the way faithful people do. We can't bloom because there's somewhere else we'd rather be. And it's not just in geography, in space, but it's also in time. We have rather be's, right? Uh, I remember when. Boy, I wish I was there again. Oh, I could really thrive back then, or in that space, or in those days, or at that time. We all have rather bees, feeling like tulips, moving to a place of scarcity rather than abundance. But the result is that we lose sight of the givenness of the world that we are in, in this moment, in this space, in this time, because we're too busy hoping for our rather bee to come along. And we miss out on abundance. And then we start to slip into scarcity. And this is the warning that I want to share. And then our souls shrink. And then our souls shrink. Jeremiah's letter to these people who are in captivity, taken away from the ones they love, being forced to do things and be in places where they would rather not be. A Jeremiah to these words is to live faithfully where you are and trust in the good shepherd, not the thief. Trust in the grace of God and look for it. He's calling them and by extension us to bloom where we are planted. And let me say, your actions, my actions, 
in my rather be in my rather not be places my actions in those places are evidence of my faith when i'm in the places i don't want to be that's where i give evidence of my faith they're my witness They are my witness to the world that I believe God is bigger than whatever is happening around me in time and in space. That I am, that you are, that we are people of faith. That even in exile, we will bloom. I remember when I was in Israel and we uh, were talking to people in Palestine um, and we were talking about things that were going on in Israel and Palestine. And I remember uh, an older man saying to me, um, and I tell you this because it made my heart sore. Sometimes my heart is sad. And these words made my heart sore. Uh, he said, you know when it started to turn down here, when things started to get rough? It was when the Christians left things started to change. That should be our witness. That when we're there, in whatever neighborhood, in whatever place, even if it's not our rather be, that it makes a difference. There used to be a preacher who used to say, if God came along one day and scooped up your church, took it away, would it make any difference to the community that you're in? its absence would it make any difference that you were gone we are called to bloom where we are planted to demonstrate that we trust that God's grace permeates everything everywhere at all times and that we are to be his hands and feet wherever we are to share his love and his grace to lift up those around us to plant gardens to have children to grow and not decrease to seek the prosperity of the city to which we've been carried we are not to wait for the ideal situation to come around before we act as people of faith because a person of faith is who you are it's who I am all the time. St. Francis de Sell in 1567 said to, when he was the Bishop of Geneva said this, true charity has no limits for the love of God has been poured into our hearts by the spirit dwelling in each one of us, calling us to live a life of devotion, inviting us to bloom in the gardens where he has planted us and directing us to radiate the beauty and spread the fragrance of of his providence to radiate the beauty and to spread the fragrance of his providence so how do we move from scarcity to abundance we begin to recognize the giftedness of this world that this world is not a commodity and desire does not rule right in a world where commodity is all then desire matters most it's valuable because i want it it doesn't have any inherent value if i don't want it it's not valuable we don't we don't you and i don't live in that world we know that you have value that this world has value whether people perceive it or not we move to a place where we recognize the giftedness of god's world then the scarcity is fought. Then our souls begin to grow and we are able to be generous and kind and demonstrate hospitality. We can then begin to bloom where we're planted, trusting in God and radiating his beauty and the fragrance of his grace to those around us, even when it's hard and we'd rather not. And that leads us to our final point, and that's a short one, don't worry. Um, because we've lost our sense of transcendence, we tend to overlook things. 
right? It's easy to overlook something when you don't value it, right? So in a world where desire is the rule and everything is commodity, then it's easy to overlook something and think it's not valuable um, and fail to recognize its worth. Jesus in scripture is very good at noticing the things that others overlook. There's a story in the Bible about a small boy and his lunch. The disciples are looking for ways to feed 5,000 people. And try as they might, all they could sense was scarcity. That's not enough. That's not enough. That's not enough. Where are we going to get more? There's not enough here. The messenger, or the meager gift of the boy and his lunch that day, although what a lunch, eh? Uh, but if that was his lunch, that meager gift was not enough. They received it and said, Lord, we don't have enough. There's not enough. And you, you and I know how this story turns out, right? That the gift that they overlook in the hands of Jesus was enough. They end up actually having more than they needed. When the world is stripped of its transcendence, when things lose their inherent value, it's easy to overlook them. Hey, there's a Latin term. I love it when I get to use Latin. Uh, the Latin term is ex nihilo. Uh, it means out of nothing. It means out of nothing. And uh, theologians use it when we talk about how the world was created. Ex nihilo, out of nothing. God is able to create out of nothing. In the hands of Jesus, five loaves and two fishes was an abundance more than they needed. So when we feel as if what we have in our hands is not enough, what we have in our hands isn't a whole lot. When we feel that way, we need to be reminded again and again that Jesus blesses those that are underestimated. The things that other people miss are the things that Jesus wants. I suspect the disciples were looking for something outside of them to come and solve their problem. I suspect they, they looked everywhere out there to solve the problem that they had here. But greatness emerged from within them. Greatness is what we find when we give the underestimated the opportunity to open their hands and offer up their apparently meager gifts. Greatness is what we find when we give the underestimated an opportunity to open their hands and offer their apparently meager provisions. Goliath scorned David. Nazareth underestimated Jesus. Felix, the Roman emperor, didn't realize he was dealing with the great mind of Paul of Tarsus. Many will underestimate you. They will. But Jesus wants what others ignore. Because he can see there's more to this world. He can see what others fail to see. That there's more to you and there's more to me. And that brings us full circle to where we started. That God's grace is all around for those who look. That God does speak. His word is alive. And so you, you're not alone. You're not alone. The sun coming through that window, the sound of rain on the roof when it comes, are gifts of God to you.
You're not alone. The world is alive with God's grace. And so we can walk in the world celebrating its beauty and its givenness. We can read scripture with expectance because they do speak. We can live generously because it's gift. We can bloom where we planted because where we're planted because we're people of faith. And we don't fear the thief. We live in faith of the good shepherd. And we can trust that God uses what others overlook. It's God's way. It always has been. And so, my friends, I invite you on the journey that we started with to find the ancient paths, to look for the ways that are good, to recognize the givenness of the world around you, and find rest for your soul. Amen. I'm going to invite the praise team to come to the front and lead us in our final hymn of praise. And as they come, let's just take a second of silence. Uh, maybe God has said something in this space and you need to reflect a minute. So let's just take a moment of silence to, to sing our final prayer. So we're going to uh, have our benediction now. And then after our benediction, we're going to have a song of benediction. When the song's done, you can please uh, head out of the sanctuary. Um, but while we're singing the song, please remain uh, standing. Uh, and now, may the love of God, the grace, the grace of our Lord Jesus, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. Amen.
Thank you for tuning in to St. Andrew's online worship service this morning. Subscribe, share, like, or leave a comment or question below and we'll get back to you. Thank you for your continued financial offerings which support the life and work of St. Andrew's by check through e-transfers to office at standrewsislington.org, by hitting the donate button on the website or our weekly email, or by monthly pre-authorized donations. If you are interested in using numbered envelopes or the pre-authorized donation program, please contact the office at 416-233-9800. As Pastor Sean will be away over the next couple of months, our next communion will be at the anniversary service with Reverend Todd Nelson on July 31st. A fellowship time will follow that service. See you next time.